Hello, BookTube. Recently, young Grix made a couple of videos over on his channel about book annotating. He was responding to a video by MJ and by Greg in another Bibliophile Reads about annotating. Do you annotate your books? And if so, how do you do it? And why do you do it? A fascinating subject, a perennial subject for readers, I think. Uh, I would love to see all of you weigh in, even if you made videos about annotating before. Make one again. Remind me. Maybe add to your points. I would love that. Of course, I thought about a response video, not just because Grix commanded us to make response videos. <laughs> when, when you get a command in that particular beautiful accent, <laughs> you almost feel like you have to obey it. The weirdest thing for you Roman history fans, I know you won't, I, I know you won't believe this. I know that when you, when you think of uh, the Roman Empire, as you do many times a day, right? <laughs> TikTok told us that men think about the Roman Empire many times a day. When you think of the Roman Empire and you think of Roman emperors, of course, the only one you think about is Marcus, Marcus Aurelius. But when you think about them, you think of them as sounding like James Mason. But actually, uh, the Roman Emperor Trajan, the greatest Roman Emperor of them all, and his successor Hadrian, sounded a lot more like Griggs than they do like John Heston. Just say it, that's all. Um, and and if, I remember, if I'm guessing correctly, Griggs comes from just about the same place that Trajan came from. Love to talk to him about it, but of course I can't stand him. <laughs> so, anyway, anyway, he did a video about annotations. I thought I would weigh in because I annotate a lot, and for three different reasons. I love to break things down into threes. Uh, there are three different things, reasons why I annotate. First of all, I annotate critically only uh, because ninety percent of what I read is new releases, and every new release that I read, whether I whether it ends up being true or not. I am reading thinking I am going to write a review of it for readers. I have, I have a, a readership that I've grown over the years, about 350,000 people here or there all over the world, who will find me. That's what you mean by readership, is people who will find you wherever you publish and read what that is. They want to read what you have to say. I, I of course, appreciate the neatness of having a readership that directly overlaps with your uh, venue. That's always fun. That would be fun. The two times where it's happened to me, it was great fun. It's hard to get that to last in the publishing world. I really wish I could. If, if for instance, the Washington Post came to me tomorrow and said, we'd like to give you a, a weekly book column, I would say yes, because that's what I mean. That would wed the venue with the readership. I would know where a lot of that readership was coming from. I wouldn't force people to bounce all around to northern Georgia or wherever. Uh, but it's hard to keep that thing stable. It's hard to keep something like that stable. You can have it for a while, but not for the length of time that I like. Uh, so most people who are out there in the, the what Gore Vidal used to refer to as the book chat world, most of them are in the same position as I am. They have sort of cobbled together a readership from different venues that now follows them. Oh, I will, I will watch for him. It's very rarely that you have someone like a Sam Sachs at the Wall Street Journal who just keeps writing great stuff for the same venue behind the same paywall forever and ever. That is rarer and rarer. That, that doesn't often happen. And maybe it doesn't need to. I mean, I have uh, Open Letters Monthly. I have Open Letters Review. It's as visible a venue as anything else. In fact, more visible than the Wall Street Journal, which is behind a paywall. I, I have places where people can go. So that, that I, but, but uh, that's what I'm referring to when I talk about annotating, is that I'm, it's all more or less, quote, unquote, professional annotating. Uh, I don't know really what form it would take otherwise now for me. Uh, so the example I want to give you is from a new release. I want to show you, I think that this, that my annotations in this particular book cover the three kinds of annotation that I do. Uh, and the new release is Anna Reed's new book, A Nasty Little War, where you have a civil war in Russia between the, the Red Army and the White Army, between the, between the conservative forces that the West can get behind, and Lenin and Stalin, who... We don't know who they are. They're bomb throwers. They're probably not stable. We need to send troops to Russian soil to defeat them. Uh, it's a, a little a little aspect of the Russian revolutions that is not usually covered in any in any detail in subject in histories of the period, and that's what this book is about. I got the advanced copy, and then I got the finished copy. And the finished copy I read with pencil in hand, as I do. And I want to show you uh, three examples of that one oh, let's, let's start with the uh the most uh meaningless of them all uh i mentioned i mentioned the other day uh yesterday in a live stream i mentioned 
that once you have a copy editor training, you don't ever get rid of it. You can't get rid of it. You can't just let an egregious error go by. Invariably, even when I'm reading a book purely for pleasure. So I'll, I'll, it happened uh, last summer with June on the Range. I was reading a Western, and I came across a typo. And immediately, well, I don't even think about it. My hand reached for the nearest pencil to circle the typo. I don't use any of the other diacritical marks that, that copy editors use, but I circle errors. Can't stop myself. Uh, so in this book, I got all the way to the end. I got to the acknowledgments and circled an error. That is supposed to be Alexander, but it's Alex Comer Lender. It's, it's just a typo. And I don't remember making that mark. I just made it instinctually. So that, that's one thing. And that's, that happened, I think that happened uh, 11 times in this book. So that's not all that important. That's a that does not really, you know, very effective uh, annotating. I just can't help it. I want to show you one other kind of there are two other kinds that I do. I should have turned down these pages. That helped. <laughs> uh, well, here's an example on a page. Furiously incoherent is a wonderful turn of phrase. So I want I want to mark that to make sure that I that I remember it. It might be it's not a whole quote. It's not a whole passage, but it might be. Uh, very useful to me in a review to find to drop an example of the author's ear for a good phrase. So you, if you're reading along and you encounter a good phrase like that, uh, I won't say you because a lot of you don't annotate. I, when I'm reading along and I encounter a phrase like that, I will mark it right away. I'll mark it on page 10 and then on page 15 to see if it becomes a pattern. Now. That's going to be interesting either way. If it does become a pattern, well, then I've got something to say about the book, right? Then I can say that the book is extremely well written, which this book happens to be. Uh, and if I don't encounter it again, I can say that it's not. I, then the the obverse proves the rule. If I'm only encounter if I only encounter a standout wonderful phrase like that once in a while, or only once, well, what does that say about the rest of the book? That says something I will tell my readers about the rest of the book that you're not going to encounter standout good writing often in this book. If I don't encounter it, you're not going to encounter it. Uh, so that's one reason why I would, I would note a thing like that. But then you, I also, in annotation, I want to note early on in the book things that the author is doing. And you have to note it when you find it, because you're never going to remember where you saw it. You have to note it when you find it, in case it becomes a pattern that is important to tell the reader. If the same word is being repeated over and over again, that might be lazy. You want to note that, because you're going to have to back it up. In a review, you're going to have, if you say the writing is often lazy, you're going to have to point to an example of that, maybe more than one example of that. And same thing with, with great phrases. If they keep coming up, you're going to want a few of them to mention. Like, for instance, on this page, see, we have writing. There are three wases right there in a row. The three wases in two sentences. And that's bad. And I want to note that to myself to make sure I notice whether or not it continues to happen. But at the same time, uh, were, the author uses the phrase a swarm of ever mutating small revolutionary parties that's wonderful, that's really good and it turns out in the course of this book that that is by far the more common thing uh, that kind of real handy language is by far the more common thing and the, the, that piling up of the word was was just happenstance and doesn't recur in the rest of the book but if I've, I vaguely notice that and then I get to page 170 and it's still happening I'm only going to have vague memories. I'm going to have to go flipping through the whole book to find earlier examples that only teased me. Once you write, you read critically when you, with a review in mind, you leave breadcrumbs for yourself all the time, everywhere, about anything, so that you don't have to agonize about where you saw it. And you, get, you start to develop very good instincts for uh, what it is you're seeing, for what things the author is doing. But then there are larger things. Things that are too large to be in any review, probably. Although in those review, I have a little more leeway there. But uh, they're probably too large to quote on a, just as a block in a review. But you want to note them because they definitely show you the tone of the book. They show you what it's like to read it. I, I did that. I did that all throughout here, where I, I won't underline it. I won't. It's very awkward to just underline a whole paragraph. So I'll just do this to show that it's the whole paragraph that I mean. And here, I didn't need to leave a note for myself. I'm, I've been annotating for so long that I don't typically need to leave notes for myself. You'll see that you, you saw that there. These annotations don't have any notes, but I don't leave, need to leave myself reminders. Noting a passage is usually enough to bring to my mind when I see the notation why I notated it. Usually that, 99.9% .9 of the time, I can flip through a book, see something, a passage that's noted in some way, and think, oh, that's why you did that. 
because this character is described in another way in a different part of the book. I realize that's probably shortchanging future readers. <laughs> in one of his videos, Griggs mentions that one of the reasons you should annotate is to leave your thoughts behind for future readers to encounter. Lord knows I have plenty of annotated books here where that is definitely true, where the person has not only annotated something but then written out their thoughts. And I'm not doing that when I do this. That is uh, probably unfair. I'd be... I'd be willing to bet that most critics are like this. They don't leave notes for themselves anymore. They just remember what it was, why it was they marked a passage. I pat myself on the back because the two two of the best critics that I know currently today annotate like this, but in pen. At least I don't do that. At least these marks can be removed. But this uh, this passage that I that I wrote here that I, I annotated here is just really clear, brisk writing. I won't be able to quote all of it, but I, it, it serves to reinforce my idea, the, the idea of this annotation, which is a reminder to me of points that I want to make about the book. So that's why I wanted to make this video, because my own uh, rationale, my own schema for annotating is probably different from some other people's. A lot of, a lot of people annotate for different reasons. They annotate for their commonplace book, or uh, uh, Griggs very charmingly mentions in one of his videos that oftentimes his annotations have nothing to do with the book. It would just be what he's thinking at the moment, or what it's made him think. Fascinating stuff. I usually can find that sort of stuff to my journal. I, it's usually not in the book uh, because 90% of the stuff that I read is, uh, I don't know what to call it, work, professional? I, I don't know how you would call it. A lot of it I don't end up reviewing, but I, I can't help but read it that way, as if I were. Since that's the case, I want to note when characters walk on stage because I'm never going to remember that. I'm never going to remember it. I'm going to be flipping back. If I'm dealing with a paper book, an electronic book, I can just ask it, where does this character first appear? But if I'm dealing with a paper book, I can't, because it's an inferior piece of technology. So you need to mark that. Where do they appear? Are there any atmospheric clues that are going to become important or be repeated later on? You've got you to note that earlier and leave a breadcrumb trail for yourself, or you're going to be at sea when you get to the end of the book and try and figure out what's going on. I've had that happen to me so many times, but not anymore. Now this is a foolproof method. So that if you get to the climax of the book and the color red is suddenly very important, being pushed towards you by the author, a part of your mind is going to think, oh, wait, that seed was sown earlier. And if the author's taking the time to do that, they deserve a pat on the back for it, but I don't remember where it was. Well, if you note it at the time, if, it, if the seed is, noted at the, is planted at the time on page 30, you're going to know that it is. It's not going to be accidental. It will probably stick out, uh, in which case you'll have a note. So that, that, that is my contribution to the great annotation war, is that that is largely what, how I annotate now. I annotate professionally for professional use, <laughs> which I don't, I don't know if that's of any interest, but I couldn't leave the question alone. I want to turn the question on you, though, especially if you have a YouTube channel. Do you annotate your books? And if you do, why do you do it? And how do you do it? Are a lot of you fans of those sticky tabs? You just get a packet of tabs and have them ready so you can tab anything, but you're not hurting the book at all? Are a lot of you fans of that? Do you write in your books? And if so, how and when? What kind? Do you leave yourself notes? Not, so you're not just underlining a passage, but you're telling yourself why you did? I want to know it all. I want to know all the details. I think this is a fascinating subject. So there you go. That's my two cents worth. I will wrap this up for now, uh, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.